What's happening, guys? This is your boy, Romeo Johnson. Thank you for joining me on the first episode of Sangas the Podcast. I'm so excited. I want to say, first of all, God is amazing. Let's just start with that. And I want to talk about everything that could possibly be a question for you uh, when it comes to this podcast. What is it going to be all about? Let's dive right into that. This first episode is called Why is Sangas the New Singers Hangout? So, of course, obviously, you see I'm speaking those things that be not as though they are already because uh, uh, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be the new Sangas Hangout as a community and talk and share and have a ball. Uh, Let's start off with who is this podcast going to be for? It's going to be for anyone who loves great singers, anyone who loves great singers. Now, that means whether you're a great singer yourself, whether you're aspiring to be a great singer or you just love awesome singers. You don't sing at all. You just love awesome singers. It is for musicians, producers, arrangers, choreographers, dancers, videographers, photographers, anyone who has worked with amazing singers and uh, has had the opportunity to use our gifts to enhance, to help promote, help support amazing singers. I want everyone's input in this podcast. So I want everyone who's had any affiliations to this game at all that's had some significant amount of years as a career. It's also going to be for young aspiring singers who want to come in and, and just learn, figure out who do I need to pay homage to? Where did these things come from? These these inflections, these riffs, these feels, where they come from? I mean, maybe I got them from an artist that's hot today. Who were they influenced by and who were they influenced by and who were they influenced by? And so interviewing is going to be another major part of this podcast. I'm going to be interviewing several amazing veterans again veteran artists celebrities veteran background vocalists behind the biggest artists musicians musical directors producers everyone is affiliated so this is going to be i want this to just be a hub for us to be able to come to and just learn and listen and talk and ask questions and make suggestions and have a ball you know, years ago in Los Angeles, there was a club called Cozy's and Cozy's was a spot. It was kind of like a jam spot uh, where we would all go hang out. Very few people understand the magnitude that that spot had for people who are touring now. That was our place to go and experiment, try things, bounce things off of each other. It was a freedom. It was a family. It was a, it was a, a community where we went and we jumped on stage and we everybody, musicians, singers, you name it. We jumped on stage and we just had jam sessions. That's where you experimented to see, does this riff work? <laughs> How does the crowd respond to this? Well, that spot, Cozy's, was started by a guy named Michi Day and myself. Very few people even know because in the beginning, it was um, kind of like a, a pub. Michi was the one that really discovered this and it was his it was his baby, his idea. I mean, it was a guy working there. His name was Morris. And I love this brother. He was the bartender at the spot. He and Michi were friends. And Michi went to this spot a lot to hang out with Morris. And he saw how these guys, they had like the little stage and these guys would get up and they would play, you know, whatever it was. They was playing rock music, country music. And you go in there, you see all these guys looking like ZZ Top or something. It was just all about long hair, beards, jeans, <laughs> you know, flannel shirts. And they were jamming. So Michi came up with the great idea to ask them, hey, what if we could get a night here? Can, can I get a night here to do R&B? Uh, so Michi Day was an incredible singer. I say it was because unfortunately we lost him a few years ago to cancer. But when I tell you this was an amazing guy with a beautiful heart and um, just was a great guy and an incredible singer, incredible singer. Um, he approached Morris and said, hey, talk to the, the club owner or whatever and see if we can get a night. And um, Morris was like, I think that'd be cool. Long story short, they worked it out, kind of got the OK. If anyone knows me well, you guys know I'm a homebody. So I was touring a lot with Janet and Michael and several other tours. But when I'm not on tour, I'm pretty much chilling at the house. I wasn't really I've never really been one to go out and about. So Michi was always that guy that would be like, Rome, you got to get out, man. Come on, <laughs> come hang out with us, man. We went to this club the other night. We got on stage. We had a ball, man. I wish you were there. And I'm always like, man, that's dope, man. I'm glad you guys had a good time. He's like, no, you need to come out. <laughs> you need to get out. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. 
Or I would say, yeah, I'm going to try to, you know, and Michi being the guy he was, he's like, yeah, that means no, you got to (laughs) come. So so he finally came to me and he said, man, listen, I want to do like a live uh, open mic thing, man. You know, in New York, they do it. You know, they got spots in New York where they have these open mics and they jam. I want to, we should be doing it here in LA. There's no reason we should not have this in LA. And I'm like, yeah, we used to. We used to have that that thing that Magic Johnson was doing, uh, R&B Live. Yeah, yeah, we need to bring that back, you know. But we need to do it. I'm like, we, <laughs> I want you to. I said, man, you know me. I don't really get out much. You know, I don't do that much, Meech. And I said, why don't you try? You should hook up. He's like, nope, I want you to do it. I need you to be my right-hand man on this, man. So he finally talked me into it. And we started putting ideas together. And I, uh, I reached out and contacted musicians that i knew he reached out contacted musicians he knew we put together a house band and we started off it was basically michi and myself and uh within the the first couple of weeks that we did it it was packed it was packed we had wonderful people helping us promote it um and then we decided you know what we need an mc we need an mc so we reached out to our friend evan linell he's a comedian and mc and when i tell you this is his lane you know uh El is like the best when it comes to putting things together and hosting things and and telling jokes and you know he was the the guy for that so we it ended up being Michi myself and Evan Linell we rocked it for about two or three weeks we were killing it and then we thought you know we need one more person Michi's voice and my voice was so different you know we wanted one other person the only person we could think of was this guy named Mavuto and we thought man if we can get Mavuto in here between the three of us we got every type of voice covered and we're all tight so there it was that was the team michi myself evan Lanell, and then we brought mavuto in when i tell you we had that place packed to the point that the fire marshal often would come and have to they didn't shut it down but what they would do is they would stop people at the line and say only five people can come in after five people leave <laughs> <laughs> so they were regulating it because we had it packed and it became a thing to the point that you just knew if you were a musician or a singer on that night of the week, that's where I'm going to be. Well, guess what? That's what I want this to be. I want singers, the podcast to be that thing. So that's why I'm so excited about it. Also, you know, I've been in the game. I'm going to go more into who I am. For those of you who don't know my history, um, I'm going to break that all down. But I want to talk about the podcast first. I want this to be a place that you can come to and just know, man, I just want to listen in. I want to see who Romeo is interviewing. You know, I didn't know that. I didn't know this where that, that came from. I didn't know that person was the one responsible for that. Or, oh, my God, I've been a fan of this person for so long. I'm so excited to see him being interviewed. I just want that energy. And so... Being in the industry for 35 years, I've been blessed to know the best in the business. The ones who are the newer artists, I coach most of them to the point that some of the, the people that I coached are coaching now. So this thing, Sangas, the podcast, this is going to be a, a place where I want us to feel like we're is home for every singer, every musician. This is going to be it. Um, I want us to look forward to this every week. I'm going to post every week. So I want it to be something we can look forward to, to just chill out, you know, grab your popcorn. Or if you're listening to it in the car or whatever, you know, I want it to be home for you. I want it to be a place that can brighten your day up if you love good singing. Now, let's address a couple of things. <laughs> a lot of people say, what is Sangas? What is that? You know, or they read it. And of course, I spell it uh, S A. You can see here, I spell it S-A-N-G-A-H-Z, Sangas. So where'd that come from? Any of you guys who are singers, we all know that that's our slang for people who are really extraordinary. So someone can really sing. We don't, we say, oh, they're not just a singer, they're a sanger. Well, being in this industry for as long as I have, when I started out, I was doing background vocals and I was playing bass guitar on major tours. I eventually uh, became a contractor for several gigs as well. I um, would contract gigs that I wasn't even on. Sometimes people would call me and say, listen, I need you to get some singers for Christina Aguilera. I need you to get some singers for John Legend. I need you to get some singers. Can you refer me to some singers? And so I kind of figured, you know what? I've been doing this for years anyway. Let me create a, a thing, <laughs> sort of a almost like an agency, but I just wanted to continue to connect people and help people. And for many of you 
who are, are, are watching this or listening to this, if you're one of the people who I put on the gig or call you for a gig, you know, it's, I love helping people. That's what it's all about. You know, these days I have to give it to these young, these young singers, you know, that are creating uh, platforms now where that's a thing that they're doing. They're looking out for each other and they're showing each other where to to get gigs. It's amazing. Um, you know, I see all these uh, background vocalist uh, sites and things. That is so beautiful. When I started doing it, that just wasn't a thing that was really happening you know your friends would tell you but it wasn't a place where we could all go and just gather so I admire you young people for doing that that's incredible and I want us to also be in tune with each other and us uh, support each other so anyway it got to a point where I was being called to send people out and to put groups together and choirs together for recording sessions and things like that and I've always said singers you know we I've I just turned 60 years old. I've been singing since I was around 16. I've been doing it professionally since my first tour was 1989. So, you know, when I was growing up, that was a thing that old folks used to say. You know, man, they, they, they can sing. I mean, she ain't just singing. She's singing. So, of course, it's the thing within our singers community that we just throw out there. I've been saying it since I was a kid. And, I, and it's funny because I when I would write it because I'm silly and I would always do silly things, I put a H Z. That was kind of my thing. I'm saying us, right? So at one point, after I'd done a few television shows as the vocal director and vocal coach, I had worked on two MTV shows with P. Diddy. Uh, one was called Star Maker, and I was the vocal coach and vocal director on Making His Band with P. Diddy on MTV. I got called to be the vocal coach for NBC's The Voice. Uh, during that time, I was also getting called to put singers or send singers out. I helped conduct auditions for Lady Gaga. I sent singers out for Christina Aguilera. I hired singers for Neo. Um, the television shows that I did, Star Maker, I hired singers. Uh, jingles, you know. So I would put posts up and I would say, hey, I'm looking for some singers. And I would always write it out the way that I write it. So about 12 years ago, I was on the road with The Voice. We were traveling, looking for people auditioning for The Voice. And I was dozing off about 2.30 in the morning. And God said, you know what? You need to make that official. You need to get the trademark done. You need to get everything official, that spelling. And I want you to do it and attach your name. As I'm dreaming, as I'm dozing off, God is showing me this vision of the word Sangas by Romeo Johnson. So I'm seeing this. And at the point that I woke up, I quickly jotted it down so I wouldn't forget. And so I thought, OK, I go back to sleep. The dream picks up where it left off. And God says, no, I want you to pursue this branding. I want singers to be to singers what the Nike swoosh is to athletes. <laughs> I'm like, what? OK, so I know how serious it is. I wake up the next morning. I'm taking notes. I'm writing it down. I'm drawing it out. I'm like, OK, I'm going to do it. It turns into a brand. I, I run into a guy and I showed him the design. He's like, oh, yeah, you should do uh, T-shirts because he does T-shirts. You should do T-shirts and you should make it a clothing line. At the time, I was I worked on American Idol under Deborah Berg. I had done the two MTV shows and I, I was working on The Voice. And so he goes, you should put your face on it. I'm like, you are out of your mind. <laughs> I'm not about to put my face on a shirt. He goes, no, you should put your face on it. You're on television. <laughs> so people know your face. You should put your, I'm like, nope, ain't going to do it. bro. <laughs> not going to do it. I'm like, first of all, if I do that, how am I going to get brothers to buy it? Dudes ain't going to want to wear no shirt with my face on it. You kidding? I'm like, maybe, just maybe a couple of females might want to. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So maybe a few women might. I can't get no brothers to wear a shirt with my face on it. What are you talking about? He's like, I'm telling you, man, you are a brand. You got to put your name and your and your people know your name now. Da 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 da. You know, you toured with Michael Jackson. You toured Janet Jackson. You've been on these television shows. You're a brand. I'm like, hmm. You know about that, bro? Let's just stick with the name singers, and let's just put that on the shirt and be done with it. He goes, okay. So we work out the deal. He said, I can make you all the different sizes, and he goes. Give me the deposit. I'll have them made for you. Um, I said, well, cool. Nam is coming up soon. Now, this was, geez, this was, man, this was 2011, maybe 2011. It was a while ago, 2011. I don't know if it was 2012. It might be 2011 or 2012. So I said, man, listen, Nam is coming up, bro. 
can I get them before them? It'd be great to go to them and have these T-shirts. Um, so he goes, uh, I have them. I have them to you. First of all, he was cutting it so close. I thought he wasn't going to make the deadline. So I was already getting mad. I'm like, man, this is crazy. Just to show you how close it was. I drove for people who don't know NAM, N-A-M-M, National Association of Music Merchants. It's a convention that would happen every year where musicians from all over the world would come and check out the new uh, merchants and the new um, gear that's coming out for that year. And a lot of people would um, form their relationships, their uh, endorsements with companies at NAM. Not only that, Everybody and their mama was at this place. It was um, in Anaheim, California, and they would basically rent out the entire Anaheim Convention Center. And it was packed with musicians from around the world. Now, when I say musicians, I'm talking about of all caliber. You will, you can walk through there and look beside you and Stevie Wonders there or whomever, Earth, Wind and & Fire. And, you know, it was that. It was like that. It was like a big toy store or mall for musicians so anyway i said man i want it by nam um he cut it so close that he literally brought me the box of my shirts to anaheim the day of nam so I, okay so i thought i was gonna make it right so he goes i'll be there don't worry i'll be there so we meet i meet him at the parking lot he gets out <laughs> and he gives me this box here you go. They're all done, bro. I'm like, cool. I give him the balance because I, I owe him a balance. I give him the balance. I open up the box. My face is right on the middle of the shirt with Sangas by Romeo Johnson across the top and then my face. And I'm like, oh, when I say furious, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? I told you. I'm talking about mad, mad, not little mad. Like almost wanting to fight Matt because he's looking at me with this smirk on his face. And then he goes, bro, I tell you what, take the money, take your money back and just to see what happens. I'm like, no, nah, you keep the money. You made the shirt. He's like, OK, just take this. Then I'll keep the deposit. You take this and see what happens. I'm like, OK, furious. Put the box in my car, had a backpack and I put a few of each size in my backpack. And I'm walking through now. The first person that I saw that I was kind of half bold enough to even share it with was one of my vocal students Andrea Jones and Andrea is always so supportive and she's so loving and sweet and and so I'm like hmm I'm like so I, I, I said hey Andrea I'm like here I got something for you you know you can take this home whatever so I'm like what size t-shirt you wear she tells me I'll pull it out and I give it to her she goes oh dope and she holds it up I'm like yikes <laughs> wait <clears throat> hold up so she holds it up and she goes, oh, this is dope. I'm going to put it on now. I'm like, uh, okay. All right. Within 15 minutes, he's like, yo, man, where's, I want a t-shirt. I want a t-shirt. I'm like, really? Male and female. So I, I ended up selling several t-shirts that day. Um, And I was like, this dude was right. You know, so I had to call him and let him know you were right. I still wasn't comfortable with it. But um, that is where Sangas came from. Uh, so when you see it, it's not just me throwing around a slang. It's been um, supported for years by one of my favorite singers in the world, Jay Moss. I got pics with him rocking it. The world's favorite singer right now, Avery Wilson. He was one of the first ones to rock it. Uh, Deborah Gardner, was the, the very first person that I had rocked the hats. You know, so it's been a thing where artists have rocked it for a while, but it was nothing that I ever seriously promoted. It was kind of a thing that I kept amongst me and my singer friends and, and my clients and stuff. And it just got to the point where people were coming to me like, hey, man, what's up? I want some of your gear. So um, in addition to being almost like an agency, it turned into like a brand, a clothing brand. That's where this S-A-N-G-A-H-Z whole thing came from, right? Just so you guys know, people sometimes look at it and go, what's what's Sangas? <laughs> so now you know it's Sangas, right? Not Sangas. Note, sometimes people accidentally spell it S-A-N-G-H-A-Z. It's not Sangas, it's Sangas, okay? Just getting that straight because guess what? I have a whole brand new line of Sangas gear coming out. 
probably in October or November. So I'm going to be bombarding you guys with that, as a matter of fact. So I think you're going to love it. So just get ready. Get ready for your Sangha's gear. All right. Let's see what else do I want to talk about in this first episode. So, you know, basically now you have an idea of what this podcast is going to be about. And you also know what in the world Sangus is. So for you guys who don't even know who I am, who is Romeo Johnson and why am I doing all of this? Let me break it down. Um, I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. My mother and father were married 60 years. I think they dated for two years and they were married for 60 years. So they were together for 62 years. I'm the youngest of four and we are all very close. Uh, we grew up in church and my mom could sing. My mom could sing well. We all love music, but no one no one really wanted to pursue music except me. Uh, so my oldest brother, Arthur, took piano lessons. Johnny, I think he played trumpet. Linda took piano lessons. And then it was me. Now, just so you can understand, I was I was a little late, right? <laughs> As I always joke, I think I was the oops baby. My my siblings are quite a bit older than I am. So anyway, when I got to my teenage years, my mom had already invested in this piano. She had bought a piano because my oldest brother and my sister both took piano lessons. But they did their thing and they moved on to other things they were interested in. So my mom was like, you're going you gonna to play this piano. <laughs> I was not interested at all, at all. I was interested in sports. I played football. I played basketball. And I was not interested in piano at all. I did love music, but I wasn't I wasn't attached to it like that. You know, I liked when my songs came on the radio like everyone else. I was like liking my songs, whatever that was at the time. I would say my mom had us listening to all kinds of tasteful music, right? So, of course, we listened to Sam Cooke, The Temptations, uh, Marvin Gaye, um, all that Stevie Wonder, all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, also gospel music. But gospel music at that time was church music. So if you know the difference, what I'm saying to you is gospel music then was not like Kirk Franklin <laughs> and, you know, Mary Mary. Gospel music was like church hymns, right? So we knew hymns uh, because mom sang in the choir and I would wake up every morning hearing her sing over the, the pots and pans clanking. And because I was so mm, not not only just inspired by it, but I was moved by it. I loved my mother's voice. I would try to emulate her at a young age. Nobody really knew that. My oldest brother had already gone to college. Johnny went to the Air Force when I was seven. Yeah. So as you, it was a lot of the time it was just my sister and I. So as I was coming up. I would just be by myself singing, listening to mom. You know, I was trying to mimic her. So I developed a falsetto early. I was already a kid, but I had, you know, I developed singing in that falsetto thing. And um, when I got older, it wasn't something that I took seriously. I just thought, well, this is cool. You know, I like singing. It's fun. But I wanted to play football and I wanted to play basketball. I started to take piano lessons and I did not enjoy it one bit. Um, and I remember that I didn't enjoy it because the teacher, the instructor, didn't make it fun at all in any type of way. I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And to be honest with you, at that time, it was clearly an energy of racism almost everywhere. So this was, of course, an older white lady coaching, teaching me to play piano. She was not interested the least bit of, uh, about what type of music I liked. You know, it was get him in, show him some things that are cookie cutter things that I do, get this money and get him out of there. And I felt it. So I didn't enjoy it. Uh, so after a few, a couple of years of that, I told my mom, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't even know if I told her. I think I just she just read that I didn't put any energy in it. And I was completely focused on football and basketball. And uh, in in my middle school years, I actually had <laughs> the idea that, hey, man, maybe I can. Maybe I can end up going to NFL or the NBA, um, not knowing that by my 10th grade year, the realization that, man, you aren't going to grow big enough to do either. And you're pretty good, but you ain't that good. <laughs> like in the grand scheme of things, you are all right. But, uh, you know, going from uh, my middle school where I was pretty good to my high school 
where it was now a predominantly black school where brothers was balling. I'm like, mm, okay, I can get in the game. I could do a little something, but I ain't going to shine. I ain't going to shine with these brothers. So the reality was, you know what? I'm liking this music thing more and more every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'm going to stick with the music thing. So what happened then was I went to one of my friend's house. I went to his house so we could go out and play football. But as I was waiting for him to get ready, there was a local band that asked his mom, could they rehearse in the garage, in their garage? And she was allowing them to. And I listened. This guy picked up his bass and played his bass. At that time, I wasn't familiar with the difference between a bass guitar, lead guitar, whatever. All I know is that I saw the walls vibrate and I felt this power. And I'm looking at him like, dang, did you just do that? Did you just slide your hand on this instrument and cause all of that, right? He literally just slid his hand on the bass and it was like, <laughs> what? I'm like, this dude just caused thunder. So I remember saying, whoa. And he's like, you like that little man? I'm like, dog, that, what was that? He said, this is a bass, come here. You want to try it? I'm like, ah, nah, nah. He said, try it. Here, just put your hand, you know, on this thing and just slide it down. I was, well, I didn't do it right. So when I tried it, it was like, whoop. <laughs> whoop. So he goes, he goes, no, 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 no. He said, listen, you got to put your hand here, slide it down the string, and then slide it back. So I went, ooh, ooh. But still, wrong. It wasn't good, but I still felt, I'm like, whoa, this feels pretty good. He goes, nah, listen, watch this. So he shows me, and I, the first time I did it, it went, Ooh. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I don't know what that feeling is, but I'm liking it. I'm liking that. That felt like thunder was in my hand. I shot home and I told my mom, mom, I want a bass guitar. She immediately said, nope. You ain't getting me to spend no more money on something. You didn't stick with the piano lessons. You ain't going to stick with it. I said, I promise you, I'll stick with it. I promise you. If you get it from Alpert, she goes, nope, nope, nope. I asked for two days. She says, okay, let me look into it. We talked to a few people. They say, um, you should get it for them, but don't get them a brand new one. They're expensive. Go to a pawn shop and just get one. And she goes, hmm, you want to get one from a pawn shop? I'm like, I don't care. We go to a pawn shop. I see this base. It's kind of... Um, almost like a pale yellow, right? With a white pit guard. And I looked at it and I thought, hey, that looks just like the guitar that the guy from Earth, Wind & Fire plays. I want that one. So she says, how much is this one? I don't remember, it wasn't a whole lot. And so she goes, hmm, okay, pull it down. So I started playing with it, had no idea what I was doing. I was just doing the same thing that guy showed me. Woo, 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 woo. So then he goes, well, you know, you're going to have to get an amplifier too. So my mom goes, wait, wait, <laughs> what does that cost? So he says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a package, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, we bought it. She said, this is going to be your Christmas gift. I want to say it was like November. So she said, this is your Christmas gift. Don't, don't, don't expect anything else for Christmas. This is your Christmas. I was like, let's go. She goes, do we have an understanding now? Don't be mad if you don't get it. I said, that's fine. Let's get it. She brings it home and puts it in the closet. She goes, you'll open it up at Christmas time. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> come on. She goes, no, because you if you play it now, you're going to feel like you ain't getting nothing. I'm like, mom, please. She lets me start playing it. I get this bass out. I plug it into, let me show you how excited I was. And all bass players and guitar players and singers, first time you plugged in a microphone and put it to your mouth. A drummer's the first time you hit a drum. Guitar players, when you plug the amp. The feeling that I got just from hearing the, Y'all know that feeling. It's when you turn the amp on and and then you hit, and then you plug the, the cable in because you don't know to plug it into the instrument first. <laughs> so you plug the cord into the amp and you go, Ooh. and when you touch the tip of the cord, it's like, Ooh. Ooh. and you get so excited because it's power. And then you put it in your, your instrument and it's all making all the noise. And then I'm playing it. Boom, 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 boom. Because that's all I knew to do. Wait. My friend Sam Sims plays bass. I got that dog on bass, and I went to Sam Sims' house. We lived in the same neighborhood. I'm sure I was on my bike. I have no idea how. I, I really don't remember. It's very possible that I literally went to Sam's house with the bass 
<laughs> with the base uncovered in my hand. Who knows? I got to Sam's house and I knocked on the door and I said, Sam, I got a base. He said, hey, man, come on in. <laughs> so I go in. I'm like, dude, I know you play, man. I got a base. He said, let me see. So I showed it to him and he goes, oh, this is cool, man. He picks it up and starts to play it immediately. And I'm looking like, Jesus, like all I could do at home was make that one or two little sounds. This dude is really showing me this is a real instrument, right? So he's playing this thing and I'm just looking in amazement. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't know that this instrument that my mom just bought me was capable of sounding that good. I'm like, Sam, you got to show me how to play. He says, okay, well, first thing I got to do is show you how to tune it up. So he shows me how to tune it up and then he goes, let me see. And I think the first song that he taught me was a song by Slave called Slide, right? And the song started off with that. I'm like, come on, this is heaven. So it was pretty simple. And he showed me how to play. He explained to me what the frets were. He explained to me the E, A, D, G strings. But then he showed me how to play. All right. By the time I left his house, I was geeked. He said, man, listen, just practice that and uh, get comfortable with that. He said, you got to get comfortable with pressing the strings hard with each finger. So obviously, I guess I wasn't doing it. I went home and practiced for hours every day. I played that song a billion times for sure. And then the next time I went to his house, which was probably four or five days later, I remember I was like, check this out. And I played it. He was like, yo, you sound good, man. It's kind of natural for you. Then he showed me a song by Confunction. I can't remember the name of it. I think it's like So Tight or something like that. And I picked up on that. He's like, yo, you're going to be good, man. Just stick with it. You're going to be good. That's all I needed. I rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and I practiced and I practiced. Now, mind you, I'm playing bass. I'm not thinking about singing at all, although I love singing and I knew that I could sing. I got really good at bass and I ended up putting a little band together and then I ended up playing bass in the high school jazz band and it just turned into a thing. You know, it was all about playing bass until my I think the end of my junior year in high school, uh, we were having a discussion um, in the stage band about the different singers in the group. And we had some talented people in that stage band. Now, our band instructor was a guy named Grady Black, who was the bomb. Like he had us playing stuff like Brothers Johnson and Earth, Wind and Fire. You know, it was it was dope. It was really dope. It was way ahead of his time. He was way ahead of his time. Uh, so we was playing this stuff and we had like a few vocalists. And I remember people seeing, oh, my God, they are so good. They're so good. And I was like, yeah, they are, you know. And then someone said, man, I don't know anybody that can sing better than this person. And they sound exactly like the record. And I'm thinking they sound good. I wouldn't say they sound just like the record. Um, you know, and I wasn't hating. I was just being me, which I found out later on. I'm just I'm very honest. <laughs> So I'm like, now they sound good. I, this, they don't really sound like the record, you know, but they sound good. Well, you can you do it? Could you do better? I'm like, um, yeah, actually. Yeah, I can. And then that became a challenge. And so someone told Grady Black. And Mr. Black, he was an instigator anyway. He was good about putting people against each other. And so he said, uh, hey, Johnson, I understand that you, you say you can sing. I'm like, oh, Lord, who told him? He says, so let's hear you. So I sang. And he was like, wow. And everybody was like, I didn't know you could sing. I didn't know you could sing. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know. Well, that year, the talent show came. And I thought, people are so used to me playing bass solos and, and doing that. I think I'm going to sing. And I wanted to sing Earth, Wind & Fire, Reasons. So that was technically the first song that I ever performed in front of an audience that wasn't a gospel song that I didn't sing in church. We had the talent show and man, I sang it. And the response that I got, I was like, wait a minute. Are you serious? Like, really? Like people love singers. <laughs> I'm like, wait, hold on a minute. This is a different energy. And uh, yeah, of course, I got a whole different attention from the girls. I'm like, wait a minute. In the 11th grade, that's that's what's important. What else is more important than that in the 11th grade? 
I'm like, wait a minute. I played a bunch of bass solos and y'all got, you good. That sounded good. You was killing it. You was getting down. That's about it. When I sang Doggone Reasons, before, even during the performance, the moment it hit, mm-hmm, oh, now I'm craving your body. Is this real? Temperatures rising. I don't want to feel. I'm in the right. By that point, I'm looking at people in the audience and they're looking like, what? I'm like, oh, this is a different energy. Mm. By the time it was over, it wasn't, you sound good. That was cool. It was, hey, I didn't know you could sing like that. When you, why you didn't tell nobody you could sing like that? I, I was like, wait a minute. You don't hardly say anything to me normally. What, 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 what's going on here? <clears throat> me, 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 me. Changed my whole life. So anyway, I took that and it shifted. I'm like, you know what? I still love playing bass, but I know I can sing. So that's cool. It didn't change my, my pursuit, though. I left Chattanooga, went to L.A. to be a bass player, right? I did a major tour with Vesta Williams as a vocalist. And then right after that, I did a major tour with Jody Watley as a bass player and bass synthesis. And then I did a major tour with Sheena Easton playing bass and vocals, background and duets with her. So, yeah, it was very interesting that I ended up even in this singing lane because it wasn't something that I pursued. Now, let me talk about something else real briefly, and I'm going to wrap this up. I've had asthma my entire life. I didn't even know that I had asthma through football, through basketball. I didn't know. I I would get short-winded. I would get tight chest, all of that, but I just thought it was because I was hustling. (laughs) I'm like, man, I can't read what I'm out hustling everybody. (laughs) No, I had asthma. I didn't know until I was an adult, right? My friend Scott Mayo was the first one that pointed out to me. We were talking once, and he said, you got asthma? I was like, no, I don't have asthma. Why would you ask me something like that? He said, you sure? I'm like, I'm positive. What are you talking about? He said, I'm just saying, I got people in my family. Your breathing pattern, your speech pattern, it kind of sounds, you know, it's a thing. I'm like, "Mm mm-mm. I'm like, don't be trying to put that on me, man. What you doing? A couple of years later, as I had moved to a new location, I went to a doctor and he's like, you know, you look really healthy, this and the other. How long have you been dealing with the asthma and how are you maintaining it? I'm like, what are you talking about? Your asthma, how are you maintaining that? I said, I don't have asthma. He said, no, no, you have asthma. I'm like, that coming, Scott. <laughs> you were right. Well. Then um, the asthma allergy specialist explained to me, he said, you know what? I'm looking at your test, your breathing test. You have subconsciously learned to manage your breathing because you didn't understand that you had a, a disability or a disadvantage. So you just figured out a way to make it work, which is a good thing. I'm like, okay. Now, at this point, I had no idea that I was going to be a vocal coach. Um, I remember thinking, this is crazy. Now I want to analyze what I'm doing. Since he's told me that, I want to analyze it. So when I ended up becoming a vocal coach, that became part of my methodology. How can I break down and analyze how I've managed this thing with a disadvantage? If I can explain to someone without the disadvantage how I've been successful with the disadvantage, they're going to soar. So that was one of the first things that I thought about. I can explain to someone how I've learned to manage this breathing thing. And if if I can do it, they're going to do 10 times better. So with that disability, I ended up singing with some of the biggest artists in the world. So again, guys, thank you so much for joining me on the first episode of Sangas the Podcast. Let's make this a fun home place of community that we can come to. Romeo Johnson. Love you guys. Let's keep each other uplifted. Take care of yourselves. And I'll see you in the next episode of Sangas the Podcast, where we celebrate extraordinary singers and we learn from the industry's veterans.